Recently, in this YouTubing career of mine, I passed the 40,000 subscriber mark. And something that many, many of my fans have been incessantly asking me to do over the past couple of years, especially when I got into making lore videos, was to do a Warhammer 40k thousand lore video. You know, the space fantasy setting that Henry Cavill came up with, which, even though it's a bit late to the scene, has garnered a very respectable following. He's even branching out into making, like, a show now. And to thank you all for being such a tremendous and supportive audience, I have decided to indulge you. The problem is that I know pretty much nothing about Warhammer 40k thousand. And getting into it seems like a lot of work, and I'm just not quite that grateful, is what I would have said if it were the case, but luckily it is not. In anticipation of this over the past couple of months, I have become a little bit of an expert of Warhammer 40k thousand lore, and just like I broke down Shadowrun and the World of Darkness settings, here is your definitive guide on all the important Warhammer 40k thousand lore. And the nice thing is, even though it may seem intimidating with the amount of lore videos that are out there, if you watch this one, you won't have to watch any of the others. Cause here's the trick, right? It looks like there's a lot of Warhammer 40k thousand lore, because all of the lore, 99% of it is lifted off the companion booklets of those like little dolls that you can buy. You know, the Warhammer 40k thousand merch dolls? And you know, like with Barbie dolls, there's a lot of different ones, and there's a, a significant, substantial extended universe. But luckily, even though those uh, little booklets, they're quite thick, most of them are repetitive in information because you don't buy the doll sequentially, you can just pick whatever one you like the look of. But that of course also means that when you read that booklet you need to grab a sort of understanding of all the basics from it, and that's why most of the lore is repeated in most of the booklets. And what I did was I didn't buy all the dolls, but I did get all the booklets. What definitely didn't happen is that I'm lying. That I thought to myself, oh, no YouTuber has ever been stopped from having an opinion on something or acting like they know what they're talking about by the mere detail that they have absolutely zero knowledge of the subject matter that their video is about. And I, for one, am not going to be the first person to break with that tradition. That definitely has not happened. This is 100% accurate, peer-reviewed, Warhammer 40k thousand lore guaranteed. And of course the most important thing in all of Warhammer 40k thousand is the various different factions. You know, the ki the categories that you can buy the dolls from, that you can like dress up and do the makeup of. And paint the colors is what I mean. And curiously that wasn't even intentional, it's just they came out of the box unpainted and then the player base just started putting colors on them and it worked. I'm not sure if that helped or maybe uh, didn't help at all with the reputation of Warhammer 40k thousand because it's been struggling with the fact that at the end of the day it's just a bunch of grown men playing with dolls. Which I personally think is great by the way, it's like a gender abolitionist somewhat type figure, I think that it's phenomenal that people pick up hobbies like regardless of weird gender stereotypes. Live your truth. Do what you like. It's a progressive audience with a progressive cause. But the the stacks of Warhammer boxes uh, for a lot of Warhammer 40k thousand enthusiasts that weren't, you know, out, uh, they kept them in their closets. They were called uh, the, the pile of shame. But as time has gone on, more and more piles of shame have sort of come out of the closet and joined polite nerd society. Anyway, there's all manner of alien empires and stuff, but, uh, you know, let's be serious, they're all just different fantasy races. Because what many people don't know is that there was also once a Warhammer fantasy setting, which is sort of the prehistory, the precursor to Warhammer 40k thousand. And it's uh, like a traditional old school medieval fantasy setting. And the planet where all that started was not Earth, but a place whose name is lost to time, but which most people just 
just refer to as Sigmar's world. Really very little is known about Sigmar's world except that it was destroyed by a technological curse known as the Exterminatus, which can destroy entire planets. And so the various different fantasy species dispersed across the galaxy and humanity just so happened to land on Earth. Except actually not quite, they sort of got split from their religious leaders. We were traveling with the royalty on like the more advanced of the two spaceships, which also included uh, the majority of the technology uh, that was taken over from the world of Sigma, which is, you know, it was more advanced than it was in the Warhammer fantasy setting, obviously, including the last descendant of the Sigma royal bloodline, cryogenically frozen. We'll talk about him some more later. Now, here is the problem. The vast majority of the surviving humanity landed on Earth, a fertile world with their cobbled together falling apart at the seams ship. Whereas the high-tech one, in an effort to save the big one with most of the people on it, crash landed on Mars, very much not a fertile world, famously so, you may have seen it in the news. And not even the marvelous technology that they carried on board was able to change that. Not only had most of the technology that they were carrying been badly damaged in the crash, there's another thing about advanced technology, which is the fact that just because you have the data on how to make something, doesn't mean you can actually make it. Pretty much all advanced technologies require complex supply chains, which is why we have trade and globalization. These things just cannot happen in isolation. And let's not forget about the very specific kinds of particular expertise that you require at every step of the manufacturing process. Even in our world, nobody knows how to make a phone from the ground up. I'm talking from mining the raw ore that has the materials in it to like wrapping around the casing. There's an enormous amount of technological expertise required at every step and no single human mind on the planet could ever possibly hope to have all of that in there. And the most humans, they didn't have even the knowledge. So the overwhelming majority of humanity, they were crash landed on Earth and they devolved back into the Stone Age and the Martians were completely powerless to stop it. But they knew that one day humanity would figure things out again and they would make their way back to the stars, somehow. Or, you know, just Mars, it's a bit closer than all the other ones. And what they needed to do was be there when that happened. So a decision was made to cut all the overhead and focus the efforts on, like, storing all the data that they had, and also ensuring that the last coffin, the cryogenically frozen unit with the last heir of the Sigma royal bloodline would remain hale and operational. Among the survivors, the exalted clergy would begin the process of altering themselves into the post-human tenders of a cult-like society. They would become the immortal religious leaders of a tiny, tiny civilization buried deep within the Martian lava tubes, guarding the technological secrets of humanity. And that is why they are called the Tech Priests. Unfortunately, the post-human augmentations and also just time itself extolled a heavy toll from the tech priests. When, 30,000 years after the initial exodus, humanity rediscovered its lost sister civilization on Mars, the tech priests had gone quite mad. And the flesh and blood population that was hanging out alongside with them, they had become a little bit degenerate in like the genetic sense. Being mostly nobility when this all started out, they already had quite the head start to Incest City, and uh, another 30,000 years of inbreeding was not very kind to the gene pool. This happened to some strains of humanity as well, uh, which is why there's great apes and even monkeys. And the reversal of that process is the reason why there's so many, like, ape and monkey-based special units in Warhammer 40k thousand. However, due to the insanity of the tech priests, humanity was not just able 
to reacquire their lost technology. They had spent the last 30,000 years protecting a frozen guy, and they didn't even remember his name. In their minds, he had become something much greater than before. And so instead of being just the last heir of the Sigmarite bloodline, he was the God Emperor of Humanity. And if that humanity wanted access to the technological marvels that the tech priests had to offer, they would have to accept the God Emperor as their God Emperor. But here's the thing, the guy who was in the coffin, the cryogenically frozen coffin, not the same guy that went in. I mean, they didn't replace him or anything in, in, as a whole, this is more of a ship of Theseus type argument. Over 30,000 years, the tech priests made a lot of genetic and cybernetic alterations to the last heir of the Sigmas. He was made into the perfect paragon of humanity. Physically perfect, handsome as hell, biologically immortal, and he had psychic powers even. Interestingly, they also made him sexless, like they just got rid of everything, the whole entirety of the plumbing, so he looks like a Ken doll down there. And this is because the tech priest figured that uh, he was not supposed to be corrupted by the weakness of his flesh, being the perfect god emperor of humanity and all that. So ironically, he, he, does, he doesn't even have a Warhammer, if you catch my drift. This is why you see so many Warhammer 40k thousand fans making jokes about the they the emperor, even though he still identifies as male, so the proper pronouns would be he him. I doubt he gives a shit what anyone calls him. He's the god emperor, he is a bit above all of that. There was a se whole series of like wars and rebellions and like Luddite movements who, of people who were of the opinion that it wasn't worth it to subjugate themselves into like a pseudo-fascist hyper-monarchist system just to get access to like very realistic VR porn. We don't have time to get into all that. Uh, there's still people like this today. They call them heretics. I will talk about some of them later. Not really a big topic, heretics. It's like a footnote in the for Warhammer 40k thousand universe. The Emperor won, that's what matters. And so the Empire of Man rose from the ashes like a phoenix and went out there to conquer the stars. It was a post-scarcity golden age of technology, baby. Which is where we are now, 10,000 years into the reign of the God Emperor. Hence the name of the franchise, Warhammer 40k thousand. It's 30,000 years and then another 10,000 years from the Exodus, 40,000. And the Emperor, well, I... He's he's not really doing so good at at this at this time anymore, strictly speaking. Turns out most of the reason for the longevity of the tech priests were that they were actually post-biological and the emperor was still mostly made out of flesh and blood. The whole immortality thing worked uh, in a way where it required blood sacrifices at regular intervals, essentially. It was a, a very special technology developed by the tech priests, pretty much the only technology that they developed during the 30,000 year slumber. The actual the actual day-to-day business of running the Empire is actually done by the Emperor's wife, Erda. And this is of course an entirely romantic marriage, because again, the Emperor has no dick and balls. And the tech priests kept their secret of that technology so close to their vest that uh, nobody actually knows how the fuck it works. Not even the Emperor himself. And the problem with the tech priests is... They're all dead. The original ones, at least. The ones who landed on Mars. I mean, not only had they been alive already for 30,000 years when the Emperor came into power, his coming into power and giving humanity back all the gifts of technology, that was the mission that had psychologically kept them active for that entire time frame. Because at this point, they would essentially, not even just essentially, they were factually artificial intelligences, robots, not even cyborgs anymore. And people viewed them as such. They had coded themselves to think a very particular way. Those few tech priests that managed to adapt to the new paradigm psychologically and exist long into the God Emperor's reign, did so by using that rejuvenation technology as like a poker chip to make themselves indispensable so they wouldn't lose their power. Some even say that this was their plan all along. But even that couldn't last forever. And so now, one after the other, over the past couple thousand years, 
they died. And the new tech priests, the later generations that they built, uh, which essentially they're just AI robots to carry the torch of the tech priest organization, they don't know jack about shit. They are deeply indoctrinated, or rather, you know, core programmed into believing that the god emperor is an actual literal god that they serve. They even call him the Omnissiah. Based on what little is known about the rejuvenation technology of the original tech priests, the smartest scientists in the empire have worked for a long time on devising a new method, or just getting back that method that the tech priests were already using to keep the emperor young. As it stands, they have to sacrifice a thousand people every single day to make that happen. Just to keep him alive. And these aren't just regular people, they are like special people with psychic powers known as Psychos, which is a dumb name, but you know, it's Warhammer. They are exceedingly rare, only a tiny, tiny fraction of the population are Psychos. But luckily, you know, the Warhammer 40k thousand Empire of Man is so gigantic that there's plenty of them. Seriously, the scale is mind-bogglingly gigantic. Those ships that you see, they're crewed by tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of people. And there's hundreds of millions, if not billions of these ships in every single fleet. And this is also where we encounter perhaps the most iconic aspect of the Warhammer 40k thousand setting, the Space Knights. Yeah, you've all seen them, those people in the fucking big, huge, massive suits of armor with the fuck-off phaser guns that they're carrying around. They're probably the visual most readily associated with Warhammer 40k thousand. And I have to say, they are actually very cool. They come in like a few different colors and uh, battlefield sort of general specializations. Uh, nominally, at least. And to that purpose, they are organized in these things called orders. And every order of Space Knights has their own, like, philosophy and symbology. Although, when it comes to the nitty-gritty, there's really not that much of a difference between the various different Space Knight orders. At least not in terms of what they do on the battlefield. Which you can easily tell because aside from, like, some minor differences in the color scheme, they all look the same. You can just buy the Space Knight model and color it whatever color scheme that you want. Because that, and the culture, which obviously is not reflected in the dolls at all, is the only meaningful difference. Which is kind of clever from like a logistics sales standpoint, if you just have to do one model. It's more than just one model, they also have their vehicles like, you know, on land, they get transported by land raiders, on the sea, they get transported by sea raiders, and on space, they get transported by space raiders. A lot of raiders. But again, those you can just paint whatever colors you want to as well. And aside from all having sworn fealty to the Emperor, each of these organizations actually has a different sponsor. The Order of the Red Blood, for instance, it's pre pretty much the most famous one, like the most prominent one, I should say, in the marketing materials, which is sponsored by the powerful High Lord Caiaphas Kane of the Cain bloodline, one of the most influential noble families in the Empire. And as some claim, a vampire. And the Black Templars, which is sponsored by Pope Magnus Alpharius the Only, that's actually what he calls himself. And this is actually the Pope from the Catholic Church, as featured in the popular novel The Bible. But it's really just the church in name only, there's a been a lot of changes uh, ever since they uh, announced the God Emperor to be the second coming of Jesus. Oh, and also Magnus Alpharius is a tech priest, so he is a robot. And the Black Templars, they actually originally formed out of an organization called the Gene Stealer Cult, which is Haha, ha, very funny, haha, ha, not a guy who stole blue jeans. No, it's a it's a person named Gene Stealer. Or I should say Lieutenant Gene Stealer. And they advocated for his canonization, they were a sort of military cult, because like in some shitty backwater colony in the middle of nowhere, he essentially kept sending wave after wave after wave of his soldiers against the enemy, <clears throat> even after the colony was completely destroyed. Just so people could say, oh, the planet broke before the god did. Which, you know, it's it's dumb to defend something that no longer exists out of, like, a misplaced sense of honor. It's also extremely fucked up to just send, like, actual human beings, 
young men and women into battle to fucking die for something that's no longer around. But that's how the culture of Warhammer 40k thousand works. I think that's a very nice illustration of how fucked up things have become. You have the Space Wolves, who are werewolves essentially, that are funded through like a tax program and if you join the Space Wolves, your family no longer has to pay the werewolf tax. Yeah, it's kind of dumb, listen, they're, they're only in here to placate the furries, that's the reason. And of course, the Ultramarines, the main heroes of the story, uh, the, the big important guys who actually fight all of the important battles and whose armor is actually baby blue and not Ultramarine. They are funded by the Emperor's personal wealth. So they're an army that he pays money to so they can pledge fealty to him. Which is a smart political move if you think about it because all of these different Space Knight orders, they are funded by various very, you know, powerful organizations even though of course they all pledge fealty to the Emperor, actually having material control over the most elite one of them kinda clever. It's very important to understand that only the guys in the actual armor are the Space Knights, and they all carry the title Sir. And because of course, you know, for systemic reasons, most of them are from the noble families of the Empire, anyone can actually become a Space Knight, no matter their heritage. They just need to have the skill and the honor and the willingness to sacrifice everything for the Emperor. They also often have plenty of like foot soldiers around them to aid them, you know, give them more ground support or air support, whatever kind of support that they need, and of course to service their complicated and clunky armors. But those are not part of the knightly order. They call them squires, even though technically only the apprentice knights are squires, but the general term is to just call everyone around them squires, even though that's not entirely accurate. And you know, obviously, even though they're only a tiny, tiny fraction of the Emperor's actual troops, there's billions of Space Knights, because Warhammer 40k thousand is fucking huge. Ironically, this over-the-topness makes it, in a scientific sense, somewhat more plausible than most other sci-fi settings. Because as TV Tropes tells us, sci-fi writers have no sense of scale. Like, if we had access to the kind of technology that the Empire does, we would be cranking out spaceships and colonies and, like, people civilizations with those numbers easy. It would not be a problem. But to, you know, turn it all back a little bit, even with a thousand psychos sacrificed every single day, the Emperor is still not doing so good. And given that he is the touchstone, the cornerstone, the keystone of all of the Empire in terms of system and culture, kinda that he needs to stay alive. And for reference of how shitty this method is, the tech priests needed like one psycho a year sacrificed to keep the Emperor like strong and healthy and powerful. Currently the Emperor isn't even, he's barely able to speak. So the principle behind the technology may or may not even be understood, it's just that the efficiency of the process is shit. And so the Emperor keeps on dying a little more every day. And yes, sure, they could find more psychos in the population, there's plenty of them, but eventually you run into a different uh, problem, that's why Thousand is like the cap, because the process sort of involves draining them of their blood, distilling the blood, compressing it, and then like sending it into the body of the Emperor. That's a lot of blood, like a lot of, lot of liquid, even when they like compress it to, you know, death. And the Emperor's blood vessels are cybernetically reinforced for sure, but even that has limits. Like. He might get a stroke if they put too much pressure in them. Or, you know, he might just explode. So while the Empire is definitely in decline, and that's a huge backdrop to it, like the whole destruction of the end of the Golden Age, uh, the main problem is that the Emperor is dying and they need to find a solution for that. And so humanity, specifically the Space Knights, are out there in the darkness, the mysterious blackness of space, turning over every stone to find a cure for the ailing Emperor. This is the main conflict for the Empire of Man and just in general of the Warhammer 40k thousand setting. The problem is, a lot of those stones have things underneath them that would rather not be roused from their slumber.
Perhaps the faction whose maw has been stared down the most in pursuit of this quest are the Necrons, which, as you can see, are basically the space Egyptians of the setting. Now, outwardly, the Necrons are basically just undead guys, but in space, which is scary enough. They're the origin of the undead plague in the Warhammer fantasy setting, because basically some petty criminal was ostracized from Necron society and just put on some random world to be isolated there. And even though in terms of like modern technology equivalent, he was basically carrying an old flip phone, that gave him enough power to become an absolute menace on the Warhammer world. This is because being by far the oldest species in the Warhammer 40k thousand setting, the Necrons have also by far the most advanced technology. And you may already be able to understand that the undead doesn't refer so much to a single species as more of a creed of existence. The Necrons are actually made up of a bunch of different species, most of whom are extinct at this point, but they're all undead. However, there is actually specific species at the heart of the Necrons, and ironically, they're not undead, they just are truly immortal, like they're not bound by the same laws of the universe that the rest of everyone is. Their minds are more vast than anyone could possibly imagine, and they've been around since the dawn of the universe, probably even longer. There's no name for them, and no one's really seen any of them either. Well, no one who isn't like a high-ranking Necron, at least. The Necrons just call them the Old Ones, uh, and who knows, maybe they're not even corporeal beings at all. And their reason for creating the Necrons in the first place also isn't clear, although the most popular theory is that they were kind of lonely because all of the species that they took an interest in would just go extinct in the blink of an eye. And the body of technological knowledge that they gave the Necrons access to is called the Necronomicon, so the Necrons call themselves after the thing that they were given. And the Necronomicon isn't so much a catalog of blueprints of high technology, but like a universal equation for the universe, like all of the laws that govern the universe in one volume. So yeah, they're, they're basically the undead servants of Cthulhu. And you might be wondering if the Necrons have the most advanced technology, why the fuck are they not ruling the galaxy? And why in the doubledy bubbledy fuck does the Empire pick fights with them? Well, the thing about the Necrons is they're not really very interested in becoming the dominant galactic empire. They do it, but only if it served their primary purpose, which is to be living, breathing time capsules without the living and breathing parts. So I guess really just time capsules, because time capsules don't breathe. Listen, if you dig up a time capsule and that shit is breathing, keep it closed. The Necrons exist on thousands of so-called tomb worlds, which are just dead-looking planets that are covered in a lot of big structures, and everything is dead. And what they do on these tomb worlds is sleep. Seriously, they slumber for tens of thousands of years, and then every once in a while, some of them will wake up and poke their heads up to see if the local galactic area is deserted. If it is, they'll just start doing whatever unfathomable projects that they undertake, and if it's not, they'll just go back to sleep. They could squash whatever it is that's going on like a bug, but frankly, it is a lot easier to just succumb to the sleepy tired, take a quick nap, then when you wake up, whatever civilization was irritating you is no longer there. Humans are far from the only ones who seek out tomb worlds and other remnants of Necron civilization to discover their powerful technologies. All of the factions do, and some of them are more subtle than others. Generally, if you manage to get around the automated defensive measures in the orbit of uh, tomb worlds, you can land there and walk around. Is You'll be fine. Except for the one tomb world that is called Necromunda, which is the capital of the Necrons, don't go there. But even on the others, if you poke around too much, some things might wake up. And the worst case scenario, which is a very bad case scenario for really anyone in that galactic neighborhood, some Necrons wake up, decide that the tomb world as a whole is under attack, 
and they decide to clean house. And by clean house, I mean cauterize the entire neighborhood with neutron bombs. The only option at that point is to get the fuck out of the vicinity of that tomb world, by which I mean evacuating entire colonies and solar systems. Or you strike first, and hard, and fast, way before that Necron tomb world has the opportunity to drink its morning coffee. The great news is that a tomb world in self-defense mode will not have access to the highest levels of Necron technology. And also fucking with one tomb world won't wake up the other tomb worlds. They're not exactly different factions, but they also hardly give a shit about each other. It doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things if one tomb world is destroyed so long as the others survive. It would presumably take some sort of magic massive existential threat to make a significant number or even all of the tomb worlds wake up. And only once did anyone come close to doing that. And those people are the Elves, or as they call themselves, the Eldar, because they are the Elders of the Galaxy and also dyslexic. Mainly, really, it's to distance themselves from being seen as Elves. They don't want to be seen as Elves. They find the things that their ancestors did a bit problematic. Make no mistake though, they are definitely elves. They are also one of those fantasy race refugee factions from Sigmar's world, except they're actually responsible also for the destruction of Sigmar's world. Elves are powerful, long-lived creatures. Having psychic abilities for them is not the exception, but the norm. And the most powerful among them are so unbelievably mighty that they can bend reality itself. And even in the Warhammer Fantasy world, the elves had this sort of subconscious parallel dimension known as the Dream Vortex. During the good and olden times, when the elves lived in harmony with nature on Sigmar's world, World, this dream vortex was a, a mind link that put all of them together and it included all manner of representation of concepts both civilizational and primordial. Sort of egregores dreamt into existence by the will of the elves. They were the gods of Sigmar's world. But as technology progressed more and more elves got enticed by the gifts that civilization had to offer. Ease of living got to them as did rationalistic methods of explaining the universe like the scientific theory. They gained the simple yet groundbreaking understanding that the subconscious dream that they all shared was not in fact just a religious experience, but a tool of immense reality-bending power. Through research and practice, they developed their psychic abilities to a level where at that point in time, the most psychically dead motherfucker was way beyond the ability of even the most powerful ancient master. And the gap between complete buffoon and like arch psycho became a gulf orders of magnitude wider. And so the elves did what anyone in their position would have done and engaged in unfathomable levels of debauchery. They graduated to being complete fucking degenerates, engaging in never ending hyper orgies looped around temporally in the dream space where the most insane orgasm you could possibly imagine was the lowest state of arousal. And in their relentless pursuit of the potential of what the dream could be, all of the rules that governed the dream, which were before that some level of approximations of the laws of nature because that was what the elves perceived in the universe, became increasingly meaningless. And as they were bent further and further, they eventually just disappeared. If you were to take, for instance, like any image and put it in Photoshop and use the like swirl tool and swirl it around for a couple hours, eventually all the information of that image would be destroyed. You would not be able to recognize it as what it once was. And what results would be a collection of pixels into which you can interpret whatever vision you'd like. Yeah, that's where the famous chaos in Warhammer comes from. It was dreamt up by the elves. The Necrons detected this, woke up, en masse and immediately performed the Exterminatus Curse. This leads many to believe that the Necrons actually encountered the Chaos somewhere else before. Why else would they wake up and act so decisively? Because Chaos is really scary. It, it warps everything it touches. It 
removes rules from it. It changes things around to drive forward the ever-increasing meaningless of entropy. And the tiniest shred of chaos will do this and propagate. This is why chaos is still around today in some distributed pockets across the galaxy. There are even the three gods of chaos which manifested with it, the most powerful of which is Abaddon. The chaos is also, rather hilariously, uh, the place where Warhammer 40k thousand has a lot of crossovers with other the universes. Think of it like this, right? All of the media that we have currently were before the thing on Mars happens. So all of that exists in the Warhammer 40k thousand universe. All of those memes have been, as chaos came into contact with humanity, absorbed into the chaos. So a significant portion of Imperial forces is actually busy fighting the Enterprise from time to time, and also various other things from fiction, which is a problem because one Enterprise is worth like 10 Imperial battleships. The Empire doesn't have photon torpedoes. Yeah, it's a very absurd setting, but I think this is a very cool detail, but you know, it's just like a side thing that you do on like an excursion quest. There's also this very poorly disguised Marvel crossover called the Harlequin Death Jester, which is an Imperial doll that you can buy, which is apparently is supposed to be like a henchman of the Joker that switched sides once he fell through the reality vortex. The elves of today have made it their mission to restore order in the universe and eliminate chaos. They're kind of like Vulcans, which are, let's be serious, also space elves. Very focused, mentally disciplined, strict. The only unfortunate thing is that the various elven factions, of which there are many, very much do not agree what the real actual reality is or should be. And because they're reality benders, still, whatever their vision is, they can still enforce it. A lot of them even think that it's a bad idea to return to an original version of reality in the first place, because those were the conditions that caused the creation of the chaos, and so they have their own visions of how it should be. And like all elves, they have the means to sanctimoniously impose them on others. So yeah, the elves are very into colonialism, they really love that shit, but uh, you know, some of them are more aloof than others. Do hope that you end up with one of those when they take over your colony. To contrast this, uh, the one Warhammer faction that definitely does not have the mental capacities to do anything as sophisticated as reality bending are the orcs. Because the setting exists to cater to a lot of stereotypes, it's not trying to be complex or anything like that. The orcs are just the good old simple-minded killing machines. And though Warhammer 40k thousand obviously has no shortage of villains, the orcs tend to be the main bad guy in like a day-to-day -day situation as like just cannon fodder enemies. As a society, they're kind of like extreme vikings or pirates. They don't really have much of an economy of their own, they just go out there and plunder other people's shit. But do not be deceived. Just because orcs are simple-minded does not mean they are stupid. They may lack the planning capacity, patience, or follow-through to build a complex industrial infrastructure from the ground up, but they certainly know what to do with the things that such an infrastructure produces. They have an almost savant-like ability to utilize the military equipment of other species. They're also very capable and creative engineers that can jury-rig all manner of shit from very basic basic things. And they also have the ability to make pretty much any weapon work, no matter how wrecked it is. They almost reality benders themselves with just how crazy their ability to fix guns is. This combined with the fact that they are extremely physically tough even without armor and fancy exoskeletons makes them formidable opponents. And they do use armor and exoskeletons and all manner of advanced military equipment in addition to being tough as shit. It may look crusty and improvised, but it's not stupid if it works. There's also a lot of them, and they have humongous genetic diversity, which allows them to fill a lot of different combat roles with an ease that other species just cannot. Sure, goblins and trolls look kinda different, but they're still fundamentally orcs. Basically, a lot of the stuff that other species accomplish with, like, training and complex technology that they equip their troops with, the orcs just have as natural gifts. And they know this, and they use it to their advantage with often surprisingly intelligent strategy and tactics. Because once again, never underestimate the intelligence of orcs 
they bank on this and they will have the last laugh. Another reason orcs are kind of feared is because not only do they always bring way too much firepower to any encounter, both in terms of the amount of weapons that they bring and the power of those weapons, they also never hesitate to pull the trigger. Negotiating with your enemy, making demands, seeking a peaceful revolution through like the threat of warfare, all that does is lose you the element of surprise. If instead you come in with shock and awe and annihilate everything in your path, whoever it is you're destroying will not have the time to organize and mount a decent defense. Orc society is organized in clans, which is actually a terrible misnomer because they don't really have family ties to each other at all. They're really more ideological creeds and the very important distinction that they all make among each other because frankly they agree on most things is what the best color is. Yeah, it's true. Uh, orcs, they do like war amongst each other based on like what their favorite color is. That's the big biggest conflict that they have as a society and quite frankly I think that's beautiful. Now you may if you look at a lot of Warhammer artwork see mainly red orcs, orcs with red armor uh, and think that they're the most powerful faction. Not actually true, they're just the ones that are most present in like empire space. If anything the biggest faction are the green ones because orc skin is green but so many orcs think that that is boring that they're not the biggest faction by like a long stretch. And every one of the factions of course uh, they develop sort of their own culture and approaches to things. Like the red ones, the famous ones, they strike especially hard and fast which has forced empire troops to adapt. But also you know the purple ones they're kind of sly and the the yellow ones they use uh, do a lot more engineering with the stuff that they get. Generally speaking though the template orcs gonna orc will hold up very well. Not all of the species encountered in the Warhammer 40k thousand franchise are originally from Sigmar's world. Some of them are truly alien. The most notable of these are the Tau, which aren't even from this galaxy. They are extragalactic visitors from Andromeda, where they're not even the predominant species. They just arrived in the Milky Way a couple thousand years ago with a huge fleet, wanting to see what's what. They are explorers, and rumor has it they're not even originally from the Andromeda galaxy either. There's also this like very convoluted fan theory that they're actually the blue aliens from Avatar, because I guess the Warhammer 40k thousand community is really into Steven Spielberg. And what the Tau found to be what's what when they came to the Milky Way, they did not like. It's not really clear what things are like in the Andromeda galaxy, but they are different, a whole lot more harmonious and perhaps most importantly, a whole lot less killy. Meanwhile, in the Milky Way galaxy, it's only war. There's nothing but war. Terrible living conditions for almost all of the people and only war. It's a very grim, dark kind of future. And that was such a shock to the Tau that they needed a couple years to discuss it. Because the Tau, they have this thing, get this, this is, yeah, this is gonna blow your mind, this is crazy. They have this thing called democracy. In a way, they're supposed to be like the morally good axis of the Warhammer 40k thousand franchise. All of the other factions are at least highly morally ambiguous, if not just entirely evil as shit. And the Tau are just the morally correct good guys that you need as a bit of a contrast in a grim dark universe like this one. Otherwise, it just becomes too bleak. Like, you need people to be trying. The exploration fleet is structured in such a way where every group sort of elects the person among them they think is more competent or trustworthy, and they then become the leaders and those that level of organization elects leaders from among them with those same criteria. So it creates this like pyramid of elected leaders that goes all the way from the top completely down to the bottom, and it ensures that in wartime decisions can be made by a small group of people, whereas when it's not wartime they still need the consent of the governed. Kinda like how pirates used to elect their captains and quartermasters and during battle they would be in charge but when they were not being in battle they could be voted out. The problem the tower facing was this right 
They really wanted to explore the Milky Way, but they thought it would be kind of unethical to just do that and in the process become a passive observer to the just exploitation, genocide, and horrible living conditions that most of the people in the Milky Way were living under. They needed to free the civilian populations from the authoritarian regimes that were oppressing them. And they understood that they weren't going to achieve that by way of diplomacy. To achieve their goals, they would be in a state of war for thousands of years, potentially. And because in a state of war, the captain decides they really wanted to avoid a sort of corruption of the system that they had within their own ranks. They didn't want the Milky Way to spoil their utopian society with its bellicose bitterness. So they spent a whole century just hanging out and developing a mission constitution in like a big conclave that would set a specific set of rules for the process of liberating the Milky Way. A lot of nuance needed to be injected. But now they are a mostly democratic society that is in a constant state of war with not the people of all the other factions, but their oppressors. It's just that unfortunately, a lot of the people tend to be so indoctrinated that they will remain loyal to their oppressors even after they have been free. So the Tau kind of have a habit of abducting people from the worlds that they have conquered and sending them off to the Andromeda Galaxy galaxy for re-education in a less warlike and more safe environment. Which you might say is perhaps a little bit of a questionable thing to do. Who knows if it'll work? The Tau certainly think it will. Now, being an ancient species capable of traversing the vast distances of intergalactic space, the Tau have access to some very sophisticated technology. They may well be able to rival the Necrons in many respects. However, their tech tree developed along very different different lines, and all of the technologically inferior species of the Milky Way galaxy are nonetheless unbelievably advanced when it comes to warfare. A field that the Tau have significant deficits in. Not to mention their whole society had to be restructured so they could become warlike in the first place. But they're extremely good at pretty much everything else. Their medicine is incredible, which makes them very interesting for the Empire's quest to create an immortal emperor. If only the very concept of an empire wasn't completely anathema to the Tau way of life. They have very sophisticated, quick, efficient, resource extraction, refining, and processing abilities, which are also very mobile, because remember, they're explorers. They've had a lot of time to study psionics. And let's not forget that they have a deep understanding of the fundamental laws of the universe, which the other factions, generally speaking, do not have. So the Tau are famous for employing all manner of interesting scientific strategies that you just will not see coming because you don't even know they're possible. So while their guns may not be the best, and while their soldiers may not be the most self-sacrificial, the Tau have a whole bag of tricks up their sleeve. The Dwarves, known derogatorily among humans as squats and among themselves as kin, have a whole mythology around the Exodus fleet that brought them to the galactic core where they have made their home. They call this period of time the Long March, and though their religious practices are in fact very secular, this mythology is still treated with a sort of larger-than-life reverence. Now, the galactic core is not really the easiest place to live. Most species have some level of special interest here because it tends to be pretty rich in resources. But energy flares, black holes, and gravitonic anomalies tend to make life difficult. The kin have long ago started to resort to genetic engineering as a solution to this problem, making themselves even tougher than they already were. Hyper-resilient immune systems, thermographic vision, temperature regulating beards, you name it. The dwarves were very liberal, experimental, though never frivolous with their adaptation, so you will find dwarves that have very interesting skin colors, skin textures, even like personal body odors. They're not born in like a traditional type way with like pregnancy and all that stuff, but in so-called crucibles, which are gigantic artificial womb complexes. They are clones, but not in the sense that they're all genetically identical to each other. A wide genetic variance is spliced into every single clone that is produced, 
so that the species can maintain its diversity. Many of the different kin lines, they do look alike and they have very similar genetics. Each generation that spawns from a certain crucible tends to then coalesce into what is called a kindred. Which are families without being families really because there's no like parentage obviously. Also part of every kindred are the iron kin which are machines, self-aware and intelligent, that are built to assist the kin with pretty much everything they do, and they are actually fully equal members of dwarven society. The kindreds are then organized into something called leagues, which are the body of government, or I should probably say bodies of government, of kin society. Each of them is ruled by a so-called Votan, an ancestor call, which was originally a sort of super AI tasked with overseeing the operations of one of the flagships of the Long March fleet. And even though they've deteriorated quite a bit over the millennia, dwarves still often revere them as gods. Not that they think they are gods, they are aware they are machines, again, kin are not particularly spiritual, but they also contain what other cultures might refer to as their ticket to immortal salvation, because, get this, if you die, you get uploaded to the ancestor core of the league that you belong to. You don't then lead a virtual existence, like you're still dead, but all of your brain data can still be accessed. And the same is true about all the Ironkin, because once again, equal members of society. So the Votan also act as big stores of ancestor knowledge, which, you know, satisfying the classic fantasy trope, they worship their ancestors as much as their gods. Kindred elect to become members of a certain league, it's not a super authoritarian situation. Individual kin have less of a choice in the matter, but given that the family bonds are almost programmed physically into the minds of all kin, a lot of the individuality that other species expect the dwarves don't really have those. The leagues exist beside each other. There's no like governing body above them, not even like a UN analog. And as you might expect, though their technology is certainly advanced, the main strength of the kin is the quality of their engineering. Dwarven bolters do not jam. But it isn't just the fact that their craftsmanship is so exquisite that makes them so reliable. Kin military forces tend to be very engineering focused with every soldier soldier able to enact complex field repairs. The infrastructure required to adapt and jury rig systems which often turn out to be way better and more reliable than like dedicated projects by other species aren't just available at fallback positions but at the front line. But really the standout technology of kin society, visible everywhere there's even the slightest hint of danger, are their force fields. They are powerful, efficient, aesthetic, and capable of cancelling out a lot of damage. To go up against the kin is to go up against an enemy that is strong-willed, loyal, and tough. Not to mention able to adapt without ever being so rash as to adapt in a way that is stupid. So they are not even, as some would love to claim, particularly predictable. A faction that very much is predictable, however, are the Zerg. Not that it particularly matters all that much, because the main thing you will be predicting with the Zerg is that they will overrun you. The Zerg are different from all the different species in the Warhammer 40k thousand setting, because not only are they not strictly speaking sapient, they also don't really use technology. Although, of course, you know, the line between what is and what isn't technology anymore is blurry and subjective. In order to make technology, what you do is you take things that exist in nature and repurpose them to a point where they are then technological. And that definition is completely arbitrary. Like the yeast we use to make beer, that's a fungus that comes from nature. It is applied to an industrial process to make a product, but so is the metal used to make the vats that that beer ferments in, and a lot of people will think of those metal vats as technological long before they think the same thing about the yeast, even though they both, like, repurposed parts of that process. Not to mention actual commercially used strains of yeast in beer brewing or all kinds of brewing are so genetically engineered through, you know, centuries if not thousands of years of selective breeding that they have much less in common with their natural counterparts 
even the ones that they were originally, than the metal in that the vats are made of, with just the raw ore. Or, you know, the silicon as you find it in the circuitry of your computer, and the way it comes fresh out of the child slave mines. And then you have nature being able to do shit that humans can't even achieve. The sophisticated things like brains and DNA, which are basically computers and nanomachines. I made- I made a whole video on this some time ago. So it's not at all unreasonable to think of Zerg technology as Zerg biology. Like, the big Zerg spaceships, their organic spaceships, they consume entire asteroids, and then Zerg workers within will extract the ore through, like, unconscious processes, and then process that ore to make components with it. A process very analogous to digestion. Except instead of using iron to produce hemoglobin, they use iron to make like huge fuck off space drives that can go faster than the speed of light. And they do that in order to go to worlds and eat everything on them. Yeah, that's really it. That's, that's, that's all they do. They just, they go places and they eat the places. And they prefer worlds with life on them, ideally civilized life, because they have a lot of compounds, both organic and inorganic, that would otherwise take a lot of work for themselves to process, so they just take them where they are. So because every calorie the Zerg consume essentially create more Zerg, there's a lot of Zerg. And while individual Zerg are very easy to kill, that kinda is diminished as an advantage when they outnumber you 100 to 1 and throw themselves at you without any sort of sense of self-preservation. Which, you know, the average Zerg is a hyper-durable killing machine that you would need a squad of modern soldiers with the best equipment in perfect condition, ideal tactical situation to take down. But Warhammer 40k thousand soldiers are a different breed. And when it comes to, like, special Specialized Zerg, there are some beasts out there. You have massive acid spitting batteries that can burn through your armor with water fire. You have huge, just basically maws of teeth. Motherfuckers made out of blades. Snipers that shoot like poison needles over a kilometer or more. Tiny swarms of extreme omnivores that will eat you and the nuclear reactor you're carrying on your back. Much of this happens through what Warhammer 40k thousand fans like to refer to as Lamarck's Revenge which is evolution guided by the will of the creature. Right, if you want to do something and you attempt to do it a bunch of times, your body will grow to accommodate it, and those accommodations will pass on to future generations. And with the amount of mutations that happen all the time, you really do not know what you're getting into any time you fight Zerg. Like with other species, you can at least study their culture and doctrines, for the Zerg, there's no such thing. Every Zerg swarm is ruled, and I really deliberately am putting this in air quotes, by someone called a Tyranid. A sort of queen not there for the sake of birthing, but for the sake of thinking with a big brain. And of course, every Tyranid looks like a hot alien lady, because they also are the rare diplomatic wing of the Zerg, and uh, everybody knows that people in the Warhammer 40k thousand universe especially love hot alien ladies. Because it's true, it's useful to have higher cognitive functions in order to make large-scale strategic decisions in long-term planning. But you don't really need all that many of those. In fact, imagine if every entity within your group had the ability to make that kind of reasoning. There would be such chaos, everyone coming to different conclusions based on their own personal life experiences, having their own opinions. Better to have a single gigabrain to, who handles all of that. Taking out the Tyranid is often a huge blow strategically to any Zerg swarm, but they tend to have spare ones gestating, so they won't stay broken for long. Plus, the Zerg have a tendency to fight algorithms rhythmically anyway, so, you know. And now we come to the section of the video where I ask people to give me their questions about Warhammer 40k thousand lore so I could answer them. And by far the most requested topic was that I talk about the Horus Heresy Betrayal. It's one of the major events in the Warhammer 40k thousand franchise. There's like a short story about it. It's a huge deal. Basically, Horus Heresy was a famous military commander working for the Empire. He was one of the most highly decorated space knights of all time. He basically had like the weight of the space knight armor that he had once again in medals. He became the Legatus of the 16th Legion, which is a bit, you know, a 
ahistorical, but this isn't history, it's a fictional setting, so let me explain how this works. So while the Space Knights are organized into orders, these orders, aside from a handful of independent ones, are all organized into legions in turn. This is sometimes made because of logistic convenience, or maybe there's even like a united identity, maybe that logistic convenience turns into a united identity. Orders within the same legion have a higher tendency to fight together. Sometimes they're disparate legions that pretty much never interact, but they have a similar purpose. Sometimes the reason for grouping a certain set of orders into a particular legion is entirely political. Legions also include auxiliary organizations that are not Space Knight orders, like the First Legion, including the Imperial Inquisition, which to be fair, most of what they do is like finger wagging, they don't have that much authority anymore. There's also organizations like the Custodies, which are basically like civil engineers, a very honorable profession, they maintain and build infrastructure. It's a pretty complex field, uh, all you need to know is that the amount of legions fluctuates around 50, and each of them of course includes billions of soldiers. The 16th Legion was one of the oldest and most venerable, operating mainly in the outer reaches of the Empire as like a big spiky fist up the ass of various alien threats that would come knocking. Long story short, Horus Heresy saw the inhumanity with which the outer colonies were treated. And after decades, if not centuries, of basically being their protector and putting a lot of military infrastructure in place, usually through the help of the custodies that he personally controlled, to help those civilian populations, he became ever more adamant in his lobbying attempts to give them some more slices of the pie to improve the living conditions of these people in the outer colonies, which the Emperor, or rather the Empress, who was at this point running things, didn't really want to hear anything about. Eventually he grew rather frustrated and he used the pretty much absolute loyalty of the people of those outer colonies and of the soldiers in his legion to him and the actual factual military power that he controlled to declare that particular sector of space a breakaway republic from the Empire. He largely disowned the noble families that ruled there. In his mind, they had benefited too much from the exploitation of the commoners, enriching themselves off their labor as they were essentially kept as slaves. It wasn't officially slavery, not at that point in the Empire, that didn't exist as an institution. But if not working in that system would mean homelessness and starvation, what choice do you really have except to be part of that system? and give 90% of the value that you produce to the people who hold that threat of homelessness and starvation over you. The wealth of those noble families was used to actually rebuild the infrastructure of these colony worlds, because of course the noble families who owned all of that shit had been continually trying to make more and more profit of it. But infrastructure is inherently not a profit generating thing, it just it costs more as time goes on because you need to fix it. And eventually if you really want to make profit out of it, you have to neglect it and then corners. The ownership of all the ventures and like profit-oriented corporations that the noble families owned was transferred to the workers of those corporations. So while it was bemoaned that the wealth of the noble families drastically diminished, which was in their minds the primary indicator of economic success, industry kept on going just fine because the people who actually did the work were still doing the work. Except now they were actually getting compensated for it, because they were getting the profits from the companies that they collectively owned, they made the money that they actually contributed to the economy. Instead of someone else whose only thing in life was that they had been born rich and or gotten very lucky. There was a bunch of other stuff, like an alliance with the Tau, until inevitably the Empire struck back. And strike back, they did did by making a deal with the Necrons to completely and utterly exterminate every single 
Horus Republic and kill every person on them using their exterminators technology. And what the Necrons asked in return were just a couple trillion corpses. Which the noble families were more than happy to provide, of course not of their own stock, but of the civilian populations on their worlds. People would be picked off the street, euthanized and sent off to the tomb worlds. Small price to pay to maintain the profit margins. And thanks to intelligence services, many of those people who got sent off to the Necrons were actually sympathizers with the ideas of the Horus Republics. Because those ideas became very popular in the Empire, which is why heavy propaganda machinery and information curtailing was put in place. This in general marks rather a stark shift in the way that the Empire treated its subjects, including a massive curtailment of civil liberties, well, the few civil liberties that still existed at that point in the Empire, and, crucially, the actual introduction of slavery. The propaganda machinery was drilled in such a way that the actual facts about the Horus Republics, the ideas that really underlined the way they did things, were eradicated in favor of making Horus Heresy and the Republics just a buzzword that means bad and evil. Because of course if the actual people of the Empire, uh, the, the slaves, the commoners, were to get an idea of what all that that shit meant, they might sympathize with it. But if they only hate the word Horus and don't even want to think about anything associated with it because they already know all it is is evil and exploitation, well then, you know, you've got nothing to worry about. The Inquisition grew in power quite massively, which became a threat even to the noble families at this time, but they really much preferred to throw in their chips with that kind of system than a system where the workers owned the factories instead of them. Anywho, a lot of you might be asking, how the fuck did this guy rise through the ranks of the imperial hierarchy with a name like Heresy? That is a pertinent question, it's a fair question. The answer literally is that was just his surname. That was just the name that he had. Remember earlier when I talked about like there being people in before the time of the Empire that resisted the idea that humanity would have to subjugate themselves to the Empire to get all these fancy new technologies. All of them had their surnames changed into heresy. And that is how, a few generations down the line, heresy became by far the most common surname in the Empire. Because there's a lot of fucking surnames, and you don't really need that much of a head start to be the most common one. But most of the negative connotations had been stripped away over the generations. It's like how there's names today like Marwood, Chernobog, or Wraith, right? They sound kind of cool and dark, but you don't, like, if you run into someone like that, you don't think, oh, this is a... Slavic death god. And then imagine those names are also as ubiquitous as Smith or Johnson. Also, Horus was just a very popular first name in his generation. It, like, it's literally basically Horus Heresy is John Smith or Mohammed Lee. The most common surname and the most common first name put together. Bada boom, bada bing. The next question is, why are there no female space knights? And I know this is a trick question uh, because there's plenty of female space knights. There's male space knights knights, female space knights, both of them are addressed as sir. You just can't tell if they're male or female because they're wearing the big ass bulky armor. It's a very common misconception about the Warhammer 40k thousand setting, but there are, they don't make up like uh, 50, but there's more like 40% of the total number of, of uh, space knights, but there's plenty of women among them. And as you can see, this was already the case on Sigmar's world, although these are of course not space knights, they are the precursor organization to the space knights. Another question is, how does FTL travel work in 40k thousand? And I'd love to say they, they have their foot on the gas pedal until they reach light speed, and then they just press the like pedal more. But that's not actually true. Warhammer 40k thousand has a hard speed of information, which is the speed of light, unless you employ a technique called skipping. Basically, it is possible within the laws of physics in our universe as well for two objects to move away from each other faster than the speed of light. That should be pretty intuitive. This isn't just two photons going in opposite directions, but also things that we might perceive as stationary if, as long as they're far enough away. Because cosmic expansion weaves Planck length diminutive filaments of space time into the fabric of the universe. Now, in Warhammer 40k thousand, you can rub up against this space time fabric and sort of burst through it 
at high velocity when you've worn it down enough. So the spaceships are now on the other side of space, not time, very crucially. But all of the significant matter of the universe, so all the gravity that draws from it, is still on the other side of that space, so they get drawn to it. So you need just the right amount of speed and the perfect angle to then skip over that space-time membrane like a stone. This allows you to circumvent the speed limit of information in the universe entirely and travel faster than the speed of light from the subjective perspective of someone on that ship. The time space on the other side of the gravitic membrane is called psychospace, and you need a psycho who is a psycho to go into it. And what they do is they utilize a technique called warping, where they will, like glass blowers, warp the fabric of space-time in a particular spot to wear it down. This is also the origin of the slang term being on the warp, which refers to being in that other psychospace time space. Now the crucial thing about psychospace is that you cannot transmit information through it. Think about it, right? The kinds of mediums that carry purely information tend to be very low on mass or like entirely massless. So they would just shoot off into the infinity of the time space of psychospace without getting drawn back by gravity. It's not entirely impossible, but it's like very, very unreliable. The Tau know how to do it, they can send messages back to the Andromeda Galaxy, but they cannot, for instance, do the same thing within their fleets in the Milky Way. So if you want to transport information, you need to store it aboard spaceships. And you can't just do that with unmanned drones because you need a psycho who is a psycho to warp. And finally, the last audience question is, where is Cadia? Surely you mean Arcadia. And the answer to that question is, in the glorious future. Because Arcadia isn't some particular world, it's the idea of a world. And by the idea of a world, I mean the idea of all of the worlds. It's known as the Great Promise in the Empire. It's a sort of political narrative that started emerging when the Emperor started to get old after the death of the last tech priest. In the future, every world will be a paradise for everyone. And all that's needed to achieve that at some point is the sacrifice of everyone within the Empire. By which I don't mean their death, although, you know, when you send them off to the Necrons, that's exactly what that ultimately means. But the dedication of one's life to the mission, to the system, of the Empire. Everyone from the highest court lord to the lowliest slave riveter must do their part to fulfill the Imperial agenda. Even the God Emperor himself. It's really there to keep people complacent, to stop them from rebelling, to make sure that whatever they think, they can always cope themselves into saying, we are building Arcadia. And if you become a deviant from that system, well, you don't want to fucking achieve Arcadia? You want to delay the arrival of Arcadia? Very convenient narrative. It's a fundamental piece of Imperial propaganda, and one of the things that Horus Heresy really had kind of a problem with. But yeah. That's basically it, and that is also basically all of the Warhammer 40k thousand lore that exists, aside from like some minor details. You know, the lore of the individual dolls, that's still relevant, but I'm not gonna cover it. At least until Henry Cavill comes up with some new stuff, which I think is gonna happen in the movie. But yeah, thank you very much for watching this video. Uh, like, comment, subscribe, share this to your relevant communities. Consider supporting me on Patreon or subscribe stuff for more definitely 100% accurate lore videos or buying some of my merchandise or my short story collection. And in that spirit, stay to subscribe for more good information that I definitely didn't make up based on the extremely spotty knowledge that I have acquired over Warhammer uh, through cultural osmosis over the years and have now like made a video that's over an hour long on a subject that this this has really gotten out of hand is what I would say if that was true, but it isn't. And see you around, cunts.